Our next step is to review actual voltaic cells. So we've balanced a redox reaction. Let's take a look at this reaction. So what's happening here? So first you want to think of our half reactions. What reactions are actually occurring? So first, our zinc solid is reacting to form zinc 2 plus aqueous. And when it does that, it's also releasing two electrons. Those two electrons are going to our copper. So our copper 2 plus is gaining two electrons from the zinc and it's using that to form a new copper solid. So when you have these set up, we're gonna have a zinc rod initially and it's gonna lose some mass as the zinc is going to disappear over time because it, well, it's not literally disappearing, it's forming zinc 2 plus, so it's dissolving into our solution. Whereas we're going to form extra copper, there's gonna be some copper 2 plus and it's gonna turn into a copper solid. So again, we're not making copper atoms, but we're taking copper that's in solution and putting it onto our metal. So if we set it up like a cell, the idea here being that if you've got a beaker with some liquid in it, and that should be flat, that should not be curvy, that's my own naturalness that I tend to draw lines that are slightly not straight. We've got a solution in them. We're gonna have two pieces of metal. We're gonna have this wire. We'll also have something on the wire, right? We're gonna have like a light bulb or something. It doesn't have to be a light bulb, but that's always easy because you can see the electrons are doing something. It'll light up when your reaction's going because electrons are moving. <coughs> so how is this set up? So in this case, we tend to put the oxidation reaction on the left and the reduction reaction on our right. So our oxidation reaction is going to be zinc. It's losing electrons. So this here is gonna be zinc solid. Also point out, if you did this in lab, obviously you could put the copper on the left. Your beaker doesn't suddenly stop working because you put it on the wrong side. This is just to know when you look at a lot of pictures, most cells, but not all, will be written in this direction. So we're gonna have some zinc solid. And in this solution, we're gonna have some zinc two plus. Then we're going to have some copper over here. This will be a copper solid. And then we're going to have some form of copper 2 plus here. No, it could be anything. It could be copper sulfate, for example, or copper nitrate. You'll have some form that's going to be able to dissolve in the liquid there. What's going to happen is the zinc is losing the electrons that are going in the copper. So if you look at our wire and you could see the electrons moving, you can't. But if you could literally follow one, it would go along this wire this direction. The electrons would flow from the zinc into the copper. This also means that this zinc here is going to lose a bit of mass if you were to measure the solid because the zinc is transferring out to form more zinc 2 plus. On the other hand here our copper would gain a little mass because our copper 2 ions are going to attach on as copper solid. And you can actually see this when you set up cells like this that you can see that you start one of the sides is going to form some little bits of solid on it. The other one is going to get eaten away a little bit over time. So, and it gets these, and it has, this is why it has to be in these ions and solution as well, though there has to be a source of zinc two plus and, or a place for it to go and a source of copper two plus. So you're going to have these solutions as well for them to be present in. It's not just going to be floating around in water for both cells because then you wouldn't have any copper two plus to turn into copper if you just had water. So this is what the actual cell looks like. And what's useful about it is we can use this electron travel to power things. Now, obviously, you also power a lot of things with other types of cells. For example, if you've got a battery in your remote control, we don't have two little liquid beakers in it. So you set them up in different ways, but it's the same idea in the sense that you're getting electrons to flow from one compound to another in an oxidation reduction reaction, and you're capturing the fact that the electrons are moving and using that movement to power something like a light bulb or the part of my TV remote control that turns on my television, something like that. So that's what it would actually look like. So how do I calculate how much it's going to do? So when I set up some cells, they're going to produce a different amount of energy than others. They're going to have electrons move at different rates. So we're going to view that by looking at a cell potential to help us figure out some about how this cell is going to work. So if I set up a cell with mag magnesium and copper, what is going to be the cell potential with it? So the way we solve this is we want to find the E cell for whatever cell we've developed, and we're going to divide it into two parts. You have the E naught for the cathode. The cathode is going to be the part where reduction happens. And we're going to subtract from that the value for E naught of the anode. This is where oxidation happens. The reason you're doing this is if you look at these in a giant table, what they're usually going to show you and what we're working with is there's gonna be a big table, these are in your textbook or in my notes, that has a bunch of reduction potentials. 
So it tells you what does the reduction reaction do. So since you're looking up the reduction potential, the oxidation potential is just the reverse direction. So it changes the sign. So let's take a look at this one. For example, if I look up manganese, what I'll, in my giant table of reductions, I'll find the Mg2 plus aqueous plus two electrons goes to form magnesium solid. And that's got a potential of negative 2.37 volts. On the other hand, if I look up copper 2 plus and it gaining two electrons, it's going to form copper solid. Form my aqueous marker there. And it's got a value, if I look it up, of positive 0.34 volts. So if I were to plug this into my equation, my reduction is going to be my copper of 0.34 volts and I'm going to subtract from it a negative 2.37 volts. So the reason we're subtracting it, since we're going the opposite direction, we'll end up changing the sign of this negative. So a neg minus a negative gives you a more positive number. So if you were to do that, you would get 2.71 volts as your Enot cell value for this reaction. Turns out we can do more with our Enot cell than just calculate them. Although we can do that too, we can do more things. So we're going to take this second reaction here of aluminum solid plus iodine and use it to form 2AL3 plus plus 6I minus. And what I want you to try is to find out the E cell value by looking them up. I'm going to move this around a bit. Am I? I'll find a place to write it. I'm going to make it tinier. We're going to discard ink. Make this smaller. Give me some more space. Make that smaller. Sorry, you're seeing me work as I go. That way we have more time. And that's what I'll do. I'm just going to make a lot of space, and we're going to use the top space for both. OK. So <laughs> you saw me do some modification. I go. I want you to give this a try, and I want to note. Try calculating the Enot cell value. Use that to find delta G and K. When you do it, if you do it correctly, your calculator is going to give you an overflow error. If I were to re-record this video and do it again in the future, I will choose a new equation. That's because this reaction is incredibly one-sided. So you get more than 10 to the 100th power. So that's why we wouldn't really talk. That's why you've got the one directional arrow because it's going to go way one direction. So try doing it. And when you get that, just know that's why it is. You will very likely have examples where it isn't 10 to the 100 and then you can do a calculation. You get a number rather than your calculator just saying overflow, we can't do this. So give this a try. Also try the bottom question where I don't give you a specific reaction, but I tell you enough information to calculate an E synod cell and a delta G. And then we'll go over this and any of the equations you don't remember, we'll be able to review. Okay, let's take a look. So first, we've got to actually figure out the E cell because we use that to calculate delta G and K from it. So to do that, we need to break it up into two reactions. So we have the aluminum and the iodine. So our aluminum reaction is that aluminum 3 plus aqueous plus three electrons. It's going to go to form aluminum solid. I'm looking this up in a, our giant table of these, and that has an E dot value of negative 1.66 volts. On the other hand, if we look up iodine, we have I2 solid goes to form or sorry, plus two electrons is going to go to form two I minus aqueous. And that's going to have an E-naught value equal to positive 0 0.54 volts. So in this case, you'll notice the aluminum, when you looked it up, that's the reduction potential. In your chemical equation, you've got aluminum written the other way. Aluminum solid is a reactant rather than a product. That means that the aluminum is the part that's going to be oxidized. And that helps us know that it's going to be the anode. So if I want my e naught cell, we're just using the same equation as before. We're taking the cathode minus the anode. So in this case, I'm just going to write those. We have 0 0.54 volts minus negative 1.66 volts. And if we were to add those together, we'll get 2.20 volts as our e naught cell. Note that it doesn't always have to be where the anode is negative, where the anode gives you a value like negative 1.66 or negative 2.37, it could have been 0 0.2. It could have been a more positive value. You'd still get a positive E cell here. So 0 0.54 minus 0 0.2 would give you 0 0.34. So don't assume, oh, that always has to be negative and the first one always has to be positive. It was in these two examples. It won't always be. So. We've got E naught cell. We can do some more calculations with that. Specifically, we can calculate a delta G as well as a K. So I'm going to start with delta G. So here we have delta G equals minus N F E naught cell. So if we plug our values in, delta G 
is equal to, first we have to get the number of electrons it transferred. In this one, you'll have a total of six electrons. Since one aluminum has three electrons transferred, and you have two of them, that one's six. One iodine has two electrons transferred, or sorry, two iodines have two electrons, but you have six total iodines, so it has to be six total. So looking at either of them, you'll have six of these. F is something called Faraday's constant, which we're going to get a value of 96,485. And then you'll have an enot cell of 2.20 volts. So I want to notice something. This Faraday number right here will be in coulombs, and it's also in moles of electrons. The moles of electrons cancel with our n up here that deal with that, or our number of electrons work, and then you've got per mole. So it might be weird, though. The part that looks weird is this is in coulombs, this is in volts. Why do I multiply those together and I get a unit that works in joules? The reason for this is volts, can be you can write them in lots of ways, but one of the important ones for us is it's a joule per coulomb. So the coulombs cancel when you do that, and you're left with joules for that one. So this is going to give us a delta G value when we get everything out of negative 1.27 times 10 to the 6 joules. And this value looks really, really tiny or huge, depending on if you think of negative values as being tiny or if you just say, wow, that's a giant number. The reason for this is it's in joules. So if I write it in kilojoules instead, I would get negative 1.27 times 10 to the 3 kilojoules or negative 1,270 kilojoules, which looks a lot more reasonable. But the first answer is right. I just want to point out that that's why it looks so big like that. Now, let's erase a little bit. Oh, you're a lot to erase. This is my very slow erase. That'll be enough. Right. So, for our last calculation, need a little more room. And then I got rid of some of the room by drawing the line too big. So our last thing is going to be that we can get E0 cell can be used to find K because it's equal to 0 0.059. I'm just going to erase all of them. That'll be easier. There we go. You know, since I was doing it anyway. This is where you can, I'm sure, watch me and go, Dr. Leslie, why didn't you erase that faster? And I know that feeling, having watched people very, very slowly do things like hand-click a whole bunch of stuff. But at least I got it right in the end. And that's what's important, right? Or, you know, you got a break for a second because you didn't have to write anything while I did that. So now, we'll plug in some values. All right, we know E0 cell. I don't need to plug in a value there. That's 2.20 volts. We got that just a second ago. And we have 0 0.0592 volts. Divided by, we have six electrons, then we have log K. We want to know K. So the volts cancel. We multiply both sides by 6, and we divide by 0 0.0592. And what we're going to get is this gives us a value of 222.97 equals log k. This is the point where we find out, wait, this value is ridiculous, because you do 10 to each power, and you have that k is equal to 10 to the 222.97. And if you put that in your calculator, it goes, this number's too big. I can't do it, Dr. Leslie. I'm sorry. So it would say, so the answer is, this is hugely product favored. You're going to get lots of aluminum 3 plus, lots of 6i minus. Your K is gigantic. Basically everything is products. You're going to get rid of this aluminum and solid as long as you have enough of both. So if I were to do this in the future, and I promise on a test you'd be, if I ask this numerically on an exam, for example, I will give you a K with an actual number that you can calculate, like you'll get in the second example. So we can see, well, the second example, it shows you. K is 1.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. So let's look at the second example. And if you haven't tried it yet, pause it and give that a shot. But assuming that you have, let's solve it. So here it says, <coughs> our reaction involves the transfer of two electrons, and it's at 25 degrees Celsius, and it has an equilibrium constant of 1.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. And we want to know what's going to be the E-naught cell and what's going to be the delta G. So for these, E-naught cell is equal to 0, 0.0, we just did this, but I'll plug it back in anyway, 0 0.0592 volts over N times log K. The difference here is they gave us K and they asked for E0 cell. E0 cell equals 0, 0.0592 volts divided by, we have six, sorry, make sure, sorry, the bottom one, we have two electrons, not six this time, times the log of 1.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. So we plug all that in our calculator and we're going to get that E0 cell equals negative 0. 116 volts. Woohoo, we got, we got something. Then we have a second question. 
it asks us what's the delta G value. So we know delta G is going to equal minus RT ln K. So here, first I'll plug in negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin because we want an answer in joules per mole. We then have a temperature, 298.15 Kelvin. We had to convert to 25 degrees by adding 273.15. And then we have it on quite enough room, so I'm going to write it down a little bit. The natural log of 1.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. So we plug in a bunch of these, and we get a delta G. Again, this one's going to be in joules per mole. So I'm going to get 22,300 joules per mole. This is a fine answer if your problem doesn't ask for a specific unit, but maybe a multiple choice it has it in kilojoules, so make sure to pay attention. And it would be 22.3 kilojoules per mole. What's nice about this, you'll notice, with E naught cell, K, and delta G, if you have any one, you can calculate the other two using the equations we just looked at. So you only need to want, know one to know all three. So anytime you need one, you might have other information. And so this is a way of saying, hey, look, use those equations to convert between these. So if we give you one value, like maybe we have you calculate a delta G for a problem. But at the end, we then ask, oh, what's the E naught cell? Well, then I can plug in my equation that has delta G and E naught cell both in it, and that'll get it for me. Or maybe I have the equilibrium constant. Well, then I can plug in this equation I just used here and use it to find E naught cell. So it depends on what I need, what I can find. They're all three always related to each other. I want to finish this off with a kind of quick question, actually. We won't have any numerical calculations. Looking at all three types of numbers, delta Gs, Ks, and E naught cells, I want to know which of these are spontaneous, which of these are non-spontaneous, or maybe it's exactly at equilibrium at standard states. Give this a try. Okay, so these are nice, quick, multiple-choice questions. They're easy to ask a whole bunch of in a row. So delta G, a reminder is it's about whether it's positive or negative is what we're looking for, not the size of the number. So if it is a positive value, it's non-spontaneous. So this is not. If it's a negative value, it's spontaneous. So delta G, it's about delta G negative or less than zero, it's spontaneous. Delta G greater than zero, non-spontaneous. Or also that means positive. This means negative. Now if we look at K, K is where we're comparing it to one instead. So if it's less than one, it's going to be non-spontaneous under standard state conditions. So K less than one is our non-spontaneous. Whereas here, k is greater than 1, so it's going to be spontaneous. So that's our general case, k greater than 1. It's spontaneous. Our e naught cells, if we look at those, our, this one is going to be non-spontaneous, and this one's going to be spontaneous. So for our e naught cell, if it's less than 1, it's non-spontaneous. Whereas if e naught, sorry, not less than 1, less than 0, because it's negative. E naught cell, if it's greater than zero, it'll be spontaneous. You will notice that it is the opposite of what you get for delta G. So delta G, negative is your spontaneous. Whereas with E naught cell, positive is your spontaneous. So make sure to keep those straight. It's a really common error to make to think both negatives or one value and both positives or the other. So they give you the opposite answer. But that's also because if you actually calculate it using those equations on our last slide, if you have a delta G that's negative, you're always going to get an E cell that's positive. Whereas if delta G is positive, your E naught cell is going to be negative as written. So that matches up with the patterns when you actually put values in for them.